Where we're celebrating the kingdom of Lesotho, and whose title is Joined at the Hip, and we are celebrating the kingdom of Lesotho. And without waste of time, I would like to also to indicate to you that this is a series of, of events, and this webinar is a partnership. And we, as you have seen now, um, uh, the two bosses, uh, my director, Jeanette, and also Dr. Butler from the National University of Lesotho. We are also in partnership with the Endangered Archives Program, Africa Hub, the Mishosha Leadership Institute, and the British Library. This is very exciting. It's been like a long uh, um, three, four, five months we've been preparing, and now we're finally here. We're joining the, uh, and, uh, the people of Lesotho, and we are, we are saying to them, uh, and raising the glass and saying um, happy 200 years and we're hoping also to be here in the next 200 years also uh, we can't wait for that i just want to sh send a, a, a shout out to the people of maseru tia dianing leribe mafiteng mohotlong kuting kacha snack and what about the the neighbors south africa and south africa's neighbors like fixbeck Lady Brand, Clockerland, Mount Fletcher, Stack Spread, Matatiel. And indeed, we are, as the two neighbors are joined at the hip. Uh, without waste of time, I just want to go through to the uh, to the program so that we know how we uh, uh, we're going to um, uh, go with this uh, uh, very important event. We will have two, uh, the opening and welcome by the director, she is ready. And immediately after that, it will be followed by the National uh, University of Lesotho Library Director, Dr. Butlem Mbambo. Uh, uh, Tata, I think you have already seen uh, her. And um, after that, the technical team will play a recorded message from our uh, DV, uh, 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 Deputy Vice Director, uh, Professor Reddy. And immediately after that, we'll have our first uh, um, uh, guest speaker, and I'm going to introduce her, Amen Tabiseng Dubazana. She's going to uh, talk, and then after that, if we've got comments, we can use the chat. You are allowed to use the chat, and we also would like people to, to to remind people to to switch off the, the their mics, and so that we give the the speakers um, all the the attention. Please use the chat, and at the end of the of each presentation, we'll have one or two, uh, maybe comments or questions from the uh, members of the of the audience. And because time is not on our side, I would like to hand over to our uh, director, UFS Libraries, Eme Jeanette Mulopiana. Over to you, Jeanette. Thank you very much, Ndate uh, Madiba. Uh, <clears throat> I want to firstly commend you on such a very, very rich program that you have developed. And, 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 and my head up to you, Mr. Madiba. Thank you. Well done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this very exciting webinar where we are going to really enjoy what we, we call academic freedom, where we discuss issues, especially of Basotho Bicentennial, where we, we will learn more and this is going to make us make sure that we we conduct research and also preserve what is we are going to learn from today. So I'm very excited. Uh, I want to welcome our speakers, Dr. Sheena Shah, Prof. Christopher Williams, Dr. Matthew, uh, Matthias Bresinger. I hope I said it correctly. Advocate Ntabiseng Dubazana, Dr. Kabela. I would also want to welcome the Chief Tenancy from the Kingdom of Lesotho. I want to welcome colleagues from the National University of Lesotho, Dr. Bouches here. I also want to welcome the uh, colleagues from Department of Sports, Arts and Culture in the Free State. I also want to welcome uh, colleagues from Mohuawa Mushoshwe. I also want to welcome Pensal. I also want to welcome uh, colleagues from Chabana Sakhomu. Those are people who we are partnering with regarding uh, Mushoshwe. 
uh, 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 200 years uh, bicentennial of, of uh, celebra celebration of Basotho Bicentennial. I also want to welcome our colleagues from the university and members of the community. So I'm saying colleagues, this is an opportunity for us to learn, to debate and have a healthy discussion and also gain knowledge and experience and, and, and also how, 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 how are we going to preserve what we are going to learn today. So um, Mr. Madiba, I do not want to take a lot of time, but I also want to say thank you for organizing and, and, and thank you very much. Colleagues, feel welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Jeanette, for, uh, for those uh, kind words. I'm now going to hand over, over to you, Doc. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words of, of welcome. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to be able to speak uh, and welcome uh, people to this event. Um, from the National University of Lesotho, we are delighted to, to join this event that we are jointly uh, hosting with um, UFS Library and our partners at Musheshwa Institute and um, uh, the British Library's Endangered Archives. Uh, the, the, the program is aptly named uh, Joint at the Hip. And I'd like to add to that that we're actually joined at the hip and at the soul, because we are one people, regardless of what flag we fly under. We are joined together by not only our history, but our culture, our language, and our way of life. And those are ties that bind and cannot be cut and cannot be replaced. So it's exciting that we could join together in celebrating this 200 years of nationhood of, of Lesotho, as joined together as Basotho, wherever we are, and celebrate the legacy that King Mushweshwe left for us. We are delighted to be joining uh, our colleagues at, at UFS who have hosted this webinar. And it's one of, it's the first of a series of events that we are going to host together, that we are going to uh, share, and that we are going to uh, uh, share, share with the communities. It's an exciting opportunity to celebrate. Not many nations have the opportunity to celebrate uh, 200 years. And so we are excited to have this season. But as libraries, as memory keepers, as knowledge uh, keepers, we are not only celebrating 200 years that has passed, but we're also reflecting on what knowledge, what ideas, what culture, are we leaving for the next generation? And so this engagement today is really a crucial part of that knowledge building exercise that we are doing so that for the, when the next generation celebrates 400 years, they will build on the work that we are doing here today. And so we so we'll welcome all the speakers. We welcome all the community that is joining us. And that together, let's develop knowledge for the next generation as we engage here today. Uh, imagine it, allow me to please invite our congregation to please join us again in August in Tababusihu. So we again will deliberate on, on ideas of how do we preserve our documentary heritage to ensure that the next generation uh, finds knowledge, celebrates and reflects on what it means to be Basutu, wherever we are. I congratulate the UFS team for putting this webinar together and congratulate the speakers who have prepared and thank them who have prepared uh, these papers. I imagine that I must also add that one of the speakers is my chairman of council. So I have to really behave myself here today. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, really welcome colleagues. And I really hope that you can be generous with your ideas and help us provide a good foundation for collecting knowledge and building knowledge for the next generation. Welcome, and let's all together have a great feast of ideas. Thank you, uh, Dr. Madib. Thanks a lot, Doctor, uh, for those kind words. 
and really we're all looking forward to the next uh, 400 uh, years. And moving on, uh, may and uh, saying to Rosanna, uh, are you ready? So you can switch on your phone. Okay. Colleagues, the next uh, uh, speaker for the day is uh, May and Tabi Singh uh, Duvazana. And her uh, biography, even if it's when you try to make it short, you feel like it's very long. <laughs> but I will try to make it very short. Uh, welcome, May uh, and Tabi Singh du, uh, uh, Duvazana. Uh, May Tabi Singh Duvazana is an, um, an African attorney who is a uh, managing director of Duvazana Attorneys. She is an ad admitted attorney of the High Court who has a right of appearance in all superior courts. She started her legal career in 2012 as a candidate attorney with the Legal Aid South Africa, where she served her articles under Alexander Justice. And in, and in, 2020, in 2016, she returned to litigation with the Legal Aid uh, uh, South Africa, where she sharpened her litigation skills. In 2019, she started to do as an attorney as a sole practitioner, where she expanded her legal experience. I'm just going to stop there, uh, and uh, I hope I've done justice, and uh, I'm handing over to you so that you can share uh, a the, your your experience when it comes to the Lesotho and South Africa relations. Over to you, uh, Medu Wazana. Good afternoon, Dr. Mwende, and good afternoon to my colleagues. Thank you so much for this opportunity of uh, having me here in this space. I didn't think I was going to be the first speaker today. I thought I had an opportunity to see other people <laughs> flow, and then I'll be able to follow after that. So, yeah, I'm a little bit nervous, but I am ever so grateful. Um, yeah, like that time one day has said, I am an attorney, and I have the privilege of having been born and raised in Lesotho, um, wherein my mother is from uh, Baker. And my, my father is from Thorntzen. My father was actually a lecturer in the National University of Lesotho. His name was Jeremiah Makotata Pedro. He died when I was probably around 10 years old. So that is my in intrinsic link to the country. Uh, my mom is still alive, still living in Pekka. And then I had the privilege of also being able to come to South Africa and study here, where I studied my LLB. And um, here it is now, 20 years later, here I am married with children living in South Africa. So like I said, I had the best of both worlds, but also I had the worst of both worlds in terms of what you experience, not only as a female, but a black female, looking at the political histories of both countries and also looking at the area in which I find myself in, which is that of the law. So I was asked to talk on the, the bridging of the gap, so to speak, or the lines that exist between South African law and uh, Lesotho law. So I am yet to register myself in Lesotho to be practicing in both countries because fortunately that is also permitted by both countries. Um, but I have also been able to assist a few people in terms of being able to research what particular laws that are relating to any particular aspect of the, of, of the law that I probably have any knowledge in within the country of Lesotho and also within the borders of South Africa. So while I was busy doing my research, I came across quite a very detailed uh, document. Um, I didn't share it with Ntatem Monde, but I will uh, send it as a, as a link, I think, uh, in the chat. It was done, it was written by a Lawrence Jumba from Rhodes University. And the heading of that particular paper was From Repugnancy to Bill of Rights, African Customary Law in Lesotho and South Africa. And that struck a very uh, strong nerve because part, part of my legal um, expertise or areas wherein I delve is wherein I delve within uh, customary marriages, uh, inheritances, um, later states, and the likes of that. And most of these are dealt within uh, customary, customary law on both aspects of, of, of the countries, in, both in South Africa and also in, in Lesotho. So there is a very minor, I, I would say in my humble opinion, a very minor gap between South African law 
and Lesotho law when it comes to the customs. As we all know, Lesotho is completely surrounded by South Africa and Basotho and their language, you can find them all the way up to where I am now in Johannesburg. You find it all the way in the Free State. You find Basotho in, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, and you also find within the borders of Lesotho, you find Kosa speaking people who are on the border side of Matadiele, wherein it is within the Eastern Cape area. And what you come to realize is that in as much as we are divided by borders, we are actually like, uh, I think one of the, um, I think it was Majinet who said that we are actually one, one, one nation and we, we, are, we can't be divided so easily. What I have also realized is that in as much as there's been independence and there has been uh, the liberation of the people, there has been people, the people have been allowed to become who they are, but that has also been trampled by the constitutions that we have, which put the, the, the rights of people ahead which is very well and good, but also it puts on the back burner the customs that the people have always had. And the people now have to choose in which regime that they want to be in. If I may be allowed to make an example, today I read a very interesting case that was um, within the Lesotho High Court. Now, in this particular case, um, the judge requested, perhaps maybe I should share the screen if I can find where I put it. Um, but be that as it may, the judge in that particular matter was asked to adjudicate on a deceased estate, wherein the parties in that matter had put down a will wherein it was a joint will. And that joint will, they had said that they intend that their estate shall be dealt with in terms of the modern law. Now, I pause here for a little bit to explain why this is important. In Lesotho, unlike South Africa, you have to decide as a person that am I going to be ruled or governed in terms of the customs? I am choosing to live my life in terms of customary law or am I going to be uh, living my life in terms of the modern ways? In fact, in that particular judgment I'm referring to, the, the clause that is spoken of, it says that um, European law, instead of saying the modern law, the judge actually chastised the legislature to say this part of the, of the law should have been changed long ago, but it remains as is. So, Having said all of that, the judge then decided to say, because the parties who put pen to paper and drafted their will stated that they want to be governed by the modern law, then that part of the law within the borders of Lesotho would be applicable to, to the deceased estate. Now, the parties that were opposing this will were the son of the deceased who happened to be a male person. Now, in Lesotho, the law of primogeniture still is thriving. But what is not the case is that unlike in South Africa before 2004, when the Bear case came into, into being, it's a situation where, in yes, the firstborn child, first firstborn male, is the, the 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 beneficiary of the estate, or in Sesotho we call it mujalefa, kena mujalefa wa the estate. But if the parties who were alive and made this will decided that customary law should not be applicable to them, then it shall not be so. So this, for me, when I read this high court ruling, it made it a little bit clearer for me that it is not easy, unfortunately, in the modern world to live the principles of custom and customary law, and then also live within the modern world because um, rightfully like, um, the article that I'm referring to, uh, that I read to by Lawrence Jumba, it is what we call the, the constitution and how we are dealing, the constitutions of the countries such as um, Lesotho, South Africa, uh, Namibia, Uganda, Syria, Lyon, 
Congo and all of those, they have introduced what we call in the manner of speaking, the repugnancy regime, which means that the customs that we grew up on, that way in which the people have always known is now being tested against the rights that are enshrined within the constitutions that we have in these various countries. Now, these constitutions are meant to make life better and easier for all the citizens of the country, yes. But what is always argued is that these customs, or I beg your pardon, these rights that are always being enshrined in these constitutions come from another uh, person's rights and customs that they grew up on. And now they just widely accept it, which in this situation is the European way of living. I will make another example. I read a case that was dealt with my, by my very good friend. He's an acting judge in the Johannesburg High Court. He made this ruling on the 14th of June. In this particular case, the applicants um, were married, the, the applicant and the respondent were married in terms of customary law. And then later on, they then signed an anti-natural contract wherein the parties do not adhere to the accrual system. With that in mind, when the divorce came through, the parties, particularly the respondent who was the husband in this particular matter, relied on the antinatural contract to say that that contract or that marriage regime trumps the marriage regime of, the, of custom where in Lobola or Mahad was paid. The learned judge, Clement um, we went to, to school together, actually, we were classmates. Um, he then penned and said in his judgment, it is absurd to say that a, a marriage that is recognized within our law should not be recognized or put aside rather as if it never existed by virtue of the party saying, oh, well, we have changed our minds. Let us now do our marriage or rather live our marriage in the eyes of the civil or stroke European law. If you have made the choice to enter into marriage in terms of customs, uh, whichever custom that you come from, that regime is the one in which the marriage should be dealt with. In South Africa, in order for you to change your marital status or your marital regime, you have to make an application to the high court, wherein the high court will then consider your papers and then say, based on your papers, and of course the creditors are not being opposed to such application, then your marital regime can be changed. This applies to marriages in community of property, marriages out of community of property without the option of accrual, and also marriages uh, out of, of community of property with the option of accrual. Now, the arguments from the respondent and the amicus curiae who had been appointed in this particular matter were saying, but it was just Lobola or it was just Mahani. Why is it such a big deal that it should be recognized at all as a marriage? The anti nuptial contract supersedes this particular marriage. And with that, that's where the issue that I am bringing to, 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 to my colleagues here um, that we deal with when it comes to trying to bridge the gap between the laws in both countries. In, in Lesotho, like I said, it is easier for a person to choose which one they choose to be governed with. Mulawale Rotodi, for example, uh, which is also very, it's a coded um, customary law, but it's also limited and also being challenged tremendously within the courts because it, it, it does not um, conform or cover all aspects that are determined in terms of how customs are dealt with. Customs are the way of, of people, the way we live, the way we speak, the way we've always grown up. But that having been to be cast aside, to be dealt with in terms of how the European style of law has, has come about is where in the issue both countries actually um, are dealing with. The upside of this particular situation is that with the sort it is only one nation and the customs are basically common throughout the entire country. So it is easier for the customs of Lesotho to be dealt with within the law. In South Africa, we have very many customs or, or traditions. We have the Kosa nation, the Zulu nation, Basotho, Batswana, Bapedi, um, Bandebele, Tonga, uh, vendor people, the list is, is endless. And with that, with each tribe, 
there is their own customs on how to deal with certain aspects, for example, marriage, inheritance, children, um, what happens to you when you have stolen, all those things have been passed down, but they're not being considered in terms of the law. In fact, customary law falls now within the bigger umbrella or ambit of the common law instead of it being recognized as a law unto itself, just like our, our sisters and brothers in Lesotho, how they have chosen to deal with that aspect. Now, the other thing that has happened over the years, such as myself, we have seen a situation of migration both within the borders of both countries. So we have the sort of leaving for South Africa, and we have South Africans leaving to go and live in Lesotho. What is not what is common in that situation is that the laws, in as much as they're different, they are the same. We are so closely knitted together that the only differences are here and there because of the political histories of both countries, how South Africa came out of apartheid and how they have had to change their laws to make sure that the kind of uh, dehumanization that happened during the er era of apartheid does not happen again. Hence the Bill of Rights, the way it has been structured, the way it's so intricate. I think one of my favorite parts of the Bill of Rights, besides the right to life, of course, is the section 28 of the, of the Bill of Rights, which is the right of children. It is very lengthy and is very detailed because we had no choice wherein there was still oppression that children were made to work because they had no other choice to survive. This led to children being fi finding themselves having committed crimes and as a result having what we call previous convictions or SAP 69s against them that hindered them as they grew older. One thing that is also a problem that we have dealt with is the fact of the borders because, for example, um, I think it was also mentioned in the in the greetings, um, wherein she mentioned all the areas that are surrounding Lesotho. I had the privilege of growing up in Lesotho, as I said, and my family, most of it on my mother's side, are based in Fixburg. And then uh, we had also the privilege of living in Lady Brand. So these are part of the uh, places that were mentioned earlier on when our webinar started. So when you live in these areas, you see just how much these particular borders, the Maseru border and the Mabutu border are so busy. They are never not busy. And as a result, it's because Basotho are working in South Africa, all South Africans are working in Lesotho. Now, in order for that to, and they commute on a daily basis between those, those two borders. Now, what used to happen when I was much, much younger is that there used to be the six month pass. Now, in the six months past, it would be a situation where there was an agreement between the Department of Home Affairs uh, within South Africa and Lesotho that you would be allowed to cross the border without having to get an immigration stamp all the time. That worked for some time and then it fell away. Now we are dealing with situations we have numerous Basotho citizens in South Africa who are here illegally, whether they're here for work, whether they're here to see family or whether they're here to, to for schooling. It puts a problem wherein we have children who are born from relationships that come between parties that come from these particular backgrounds and then they end up being stateless because as a mother who is from Lesotho and not from South Africa and not married to the gentleman who is in your life who came from South Africa, then you find yourself having a child who cannot be registered as a result. That is where, in my humble opinion, home affairs would need to change its ways because the Department of Home Affairs in South Africa says that if the minor child is born from the mother, and the mother is not a South African citizen, they will not allocate citizenship to this child, even though the father is a citizen. We are in the process of trying to challenge this aspect um, in terms of what the Home Affairs is doing, and we are, we are facing an uphill battle. It should be that if a, if a child is born 
within these two states, as married as they are, you should be able to have dual citizenship. I say this because both countries are not opposed to dual citizenship, but it is such a problem that we find ourselves in situations where crimes are being committed in one country by these citizens and then also in another country by the other citizens. We need to find a way to bridge a gap wherein because we are so linked to one another. In fact, Lesotho is within the borders of South Africa in such a way that you cannot leave the country without having first to cross into South Africa. We need to find a way to try and make sure that our laws marry one another and then they make sense to, to, to ensure that our citizens on both sides are protected. Our customs as Basotho are mainly entrenched and survive within the borders of Lesotho. We have very many South Africans who are Basotho but do not know much about their culture. They do not know much about their customs. Some of them don't even have a passport to cross the border. So they will never set foot in Lesotho as a result. Now, the way in which the law is dealing with the customs, unfortunately, they are dying. And as a result, we need to find a way to ensure that our customs do not die within the next 200 years. So that when our, our children's children's children have something like what we are having today in this particular webinar, they can still talk on things that we are talking on right now. Maybe they would be in, even in a better position because they would have had um, saved documentary evidence, video evidence of what it is that we do as a nation of Basud. It is very unfortunate that in every sphere, as, let me speak to it in my sphere, in, in, in the law, how the, the, the customs of our people are trampled upon. It is deemed primitive. It is deemed to not be civilized. In 2024, a judgment handed out on the 14th of June says exactly that wherein the, the, the respondents and the amicus curiae that were appointed for this matter state unequivocally that why is it important for us to even recognize customary law, uh, customary marriage, when there is an anti-natural contract that was signed after the fact? Now it goes back to what uh, this 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 article I'm referring to speaks on the repugnancy law, that everything that comes with the constitutions that we have within our countries, when it comes or it's put up against our customs, it makes our customs to be repugnant. It makes as if what we are dealing with does not make any sense. Why should it be incorporated? Fighting for that is one of the hardest things that I, in my profession right now, has been, have been dealing with. When it comes to deceased estates, I mentioned earlier on the Bear case that was decided in 2004. I think then I was doing my first year. In 2004, it was a situation where in, in terms of the administration of deceased estates, Black people were not even considered within the administration of deceased estates. It's only 20 years ago. And Mebe and others were then challenging the fact that the law of primogeniture should not apply, not customary law, the law of primogeniture wherein the eldest uh, remaining sibling on the husband's side should be the one to take over the estate of the deceased. That is the one aspect that was being challenged within that. But with that, it also repealed the Black Administration um, deceased, I mean, Administration of Deceased Estates Act, which was in existence since the 1800s. It only got repealed in 2004. What I am getting to with this is that our culture, our custom, the way that we do things, it is not primitive. The way we do things is how we live, is how we are raised, is how our children um, continue to be raised. And if we allow ourselves or allow the laws to continue to trample on the rights that we have as a people, that we'll be able to, uh, that we'll be able to, to continue on and teach our children what it is is expected of them as, as a Mosoto person. We will find ourselves in a situation where we recall that it used to be in this particular way and not the same. I don't know if I'm I'm going over my time. I think I saw a message that um, 
uh, one of our members is leaving. Uh, in the day, Monday, have I exceeded my time? Sorry, are you about to wrap up? Uh, maybe we can uh, ask because there are two co presenters. If it happens yes. that the other one will leave, then we will maybe give on, uh, uh, the other one a chance to, to, to present. Okay, and I was wrapping up. I just wanted to be sure I haven't exceeded my time. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's fine. You can just wrap up. It's okay. Okay. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, um, I am what I do. I love what I do. The, the, the law is a beautiful area. It is somewhere where there is so much growth to be had and interpretation of the law is not stagnant. And as a result, we are able to incorporate certain things that we believe should be incorporated. The beauty of the Bill of Rights in the South African constitution that it gives leeway to this. In fact, your, your beliefs as a person are guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. As a result, I hope that uh, webinars such as this uh, will happen more often wherein we can engage and um, have dialogue on how to preserve our, our rights, our customs, and our beliefs as the Basotho Nation. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Mental uh, Singh uh, Dubazan. Colleagues, I would like uh, us to give her a round of applause in an electronic way, in the electronic way. Thanks, 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 thanks a lot, and Tabi Singh. And we we'll really appreciate if you can share that uh, 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 Lawrence uh, 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 Jumba article that you said you're going to to share because we really appreciate that. And uh, I would also like to uh, pose a question that maybe uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're still going to be here because I just had for just have a question that I wanted to 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 ask you. But now I'm looking at the the next speaker, and she has indicated that they are in a hurry. Uh, Shina, I'm not sure if we can give you, but I will type my questions on 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 the chat. Um, uh, meant to be saying so uh, so that immediately after they've presented, I know I've messed up a little bit. I've forgot to play the recording of the DVC uh, uh, research and digitalization. I will then give uh, uh, Shina, Dr. Shina, and I'm not sure if they are ready. Uh, and, and Dr. Matthias, a chance, and, call, and and the members of the audience, I would like to ask them to start uh, engaging on the chat. I've also got a question that I want to ask uh, uh, me and Tabi Singh, but just because of the, the, the problem that the Matthias has, has indicated, I would like to, uh, uh, to move on to my uh, to them, Dr. Ashina and, uh, and Dr. Matthias, are you, are you on the line? Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Shina. Yes, yes. I'm back on uh, um, uh, so, sorry, of... sorry, sorry for pu pushing this, but it's but uh, but but we can come back to uh, and Tabi Seng's uh, talk after yes. our talk, uh, yes. and 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 then we can we can spend time yes. then to yes. It's fine. I, I'm 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 not going to 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 for the sake of time. Uh, we with the biographs uh, have been shared with the yeah. with the members of the audience. Uh, I'm going to hand over to you, uh, Dr. Shinasha, and then after that it will be uh, Dr. Matthias uh, uh, Brenzinger. Over to you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm. I'm going to start. You hear me all, or everything is fine with the audio? Yes, Doc, you can go on. And uh, Sheena, how is the, the presentation coming up? So you see now the slides. Yes, Doc. OK, uh, thank you so much for, for, for organizing this webinar and including us um, on, on, uh, and, and giving us the chance to talk about our work. So we started, Gina and I uh, came to Lesotho, to the Baputi area, first time in 2016. We both know each other from, from Cape Town, where I used to work. Uh, in, I mean, I was the director of the Center for African Language Diversity for, for several years. I'm now retired, and uh, the two of us, Sheena uh, and I, we are both affiliates uh, to the University of the Free State 
We are very grateful for that. So Lizzo Kumezi, uh, who is uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Law at, uh, at the University of Lesotho, unfortunately won't be able to join us, but he is part of uh, our presentation. Um, okay, you see the title uh, which we decided on is actually a paper we, we, which is online available, which is published by the three of us. And uh, you might have a chance to look at these three axes. So our brief presentation uh, will be on the Epaputi. So we heard a lot about Basutu, Basutu culture, and we would like to add to this uh, the, another dimension, which is the Epaputi nation, which is part of Lesotho and also uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, though the first uh, thing I want to briefly introduce is the distribution of the Epaputi. Uh, uh, so you see there are mainly in uh, three, dis uh, three districts of Lesotho, so Uting, Mahalishuk, and uh, Kwachas Nek. And there are also uh, um, several hundreds uh, uh, of speakers of Seputi in uh, eastern in the eastern Cape province you will hear that i'm always or very often focusing on speakers because we are both linguists and our main concern in is to document the language uh next slide please uh, so sheena has to operate the slides for some reason i'm not able to do that and so the main the core area uh, where siputi is spoken so are uh, Daliwe, which is uh, both, and Singondo, they are both rivers, and uh, the, in the valleys, uh, Daliwe especially uh, is considered to be the core area uh, where the language is still spoken as a first language by children. Um, the same in Singondo, uh, where the majority language is, however, Isikosa. Is, is, is so, um, so these are the two main areas where we collect stories and work, which is going, uh, which is the topic uh, Sheena is going to elaborate on. Um, there are Ibaputi all over South Africa distributed because uh, many of them had to leave uh, Lesotho for, yeah, in in search for work, like they're working on farms, on on plantations, and in the mines, um, and. Uh, Oh, next slide. So we, uh, I'm. So these slides are uh, from the areas where we work. This is in Hasleela, um, in the Dalibe River Valley, and the next slide slide is uh, from Simondo. So actually, this is uh, in the Tele River Valley, uh, Han Hanoi. So she is the chief of this village, and those villages are uh, Puti speaking villages. There are some uh, sort of islands, Seputi speaking islands in other parts, uh, like in Kwachas Neck, uh, this one here in Mosene King, uh, where people in the village speak predominantly Seputi, uh, while in most parts of uh, Kwachas Neck, uh, the people speak the dominant national language, uh, Sisutu. Um, so uh, there is a, a community, a very active community of uh, of Ebaputi and Seputi speakers uh, in Maratie, uh, Masakala, the, the village uh, of the chief uh, of Maratie, of the Maratie Ebaputi. Uh, they are very active and there is a lot of collaboration with the Ebaputi from uh, Lesotho uh, with regard to language and also culture. So this is a picture of the area there in the Eastern Cape. Um, Next slide. Uh, I I need to to just briefly summarize some points of the history. So the Ebaputi uh, originate from the Kwasulu from Kwasulu Natal, especially the Tugela area, and they arrived in the southern part of today's Lesotho in around 1800. Uh, next slide. In different migration waves, as you see, uh, where. Um, um, Morena uh, Mukwane uh, collected the people. There was a, a desperate situation for starvation. There was a violence. And at that time, uh, um, um, Morena Morosi was 
assigned by his father to, to form a nation, uh, which then became known as the Baputi nation. And so the origin of those uh, uh, of this nation uh, is diverse, and so it's the language. So the language uh, is a mix of uh, different. So it's it's based on on Tequila and Guni, uh, and uh, but it's also heavily influenced by Sesotho right from the beginning. Um, can you bring the next slide, please? So this picture was Morena Morosi, who fought also against the um, British oppressors. So and uh, they then uh, who who then didn't accept his uh, his yeah opposition, and uh, and the, there was a final battle which lasted for eight months, where on Mount Morosi, um, a, a fight with the British who were supported by the Basutu took place, and after eight months, uh, the British and Basutu succeeded. And during this uh, time of struggle, uh, the chief uh, Morena Morosi uh, lost his life, uh, and uh, which is now uh, commemorated on the 19th of November uh, annually. Um, and next slide. And this, the death of Morena Morosi, was a, a significant change in uh, in the for the Putin nation. Because uh, from then on, uh, they were no longer allowed to live together in larger numbers. Uh, they were deprived of any political representation. So there were chiefs assigned from outside to in these villages. And then one uh, scholar here observed in, in 1980, uh, 1953 that the Baputi uh, completely assimilated to the Sutu culture. And he stated, the Puti are now Basotho. Next slide. This is not the case. So the Baputi are not Basotho. And even though they lost their culture and they are joining uh, initiation, uh, initiation ceremonies of boys and girls uh, with the Basotho of the area, also the children games, even if they speak Seputi during those games and tell stories in Seputi, they are usually translated stories from Setswana. So there is uh, uh, Sesotho. So there is uh, we, we, there are no st indigenous stories, uh, uh, ancient stories uh, we are aware of. But there is a very strong Puti ethnic identity, and uh, there is an increasing spread and revitalization of the ancestral language Siputi. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> uh, one of the main challenges in this area is uh, formal education. Uh, so there are others like uh, infrastructure, uh, low employment, and, and, and so on. But one of the, one of the key challenges uh, in formal education is that uh, long distances to schools boys are usually herding cattle and the girls are um, at home uh, or on fields work, uh, supporting their mothers which means there is very low enrollment uh, rates and also very few epaputi uh, complete formal education but the main reason for that is sesutu and english are the exclusive media of instruction next slide um, when we started uh, to work in, in Lesotho on Siputi, uh, we visited uh, the Daliwe Primary School and asked the children to stand up uh, who speak uh, uh, Siputi at home as the first language. And all the standing children are speaking Siputi at home. And many of them were not fluent in Sesotho and, and very, they spoke very little English. Um, and the, the, I mean, and the teachers didn't speak Saputi. So in this situation, education is, uh, yeah, it's very difficult for these children to, to acquire any knowledge. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, to, to challenge, uh, to, to address these challenges, a group, uh, Lebatla Lebaputi was formed uh, and uh, one of the main agendas of this group is to de develop and revitalize Seputi. So this is one of the meetings of the, the first, uh, one of the first meetings we are attended 
Uh, and uh, you see the late chief, Baputi chief in the middle, this young man, he, he passed, he died in a road accident just three, uh, three months after this picture was taken. Next slide. Another forum, uh, which is essential for the revival uh, movement of, of, uh, um, of Seputi is uh, the WhatsApp group, Ekaya Lebaputi, uh, where you see that there are now 600, about 600 members, and there the discussions on terms, on spellings, uh, um, is, uh, is conducted by, by members of, of this group. Next one. <clears throat> um, Another activity we want to mention is that Whitecliffe uh, uh, and also the, the Soto Bible Translation Society that they are translating Bible stories in Seputi. <clears throat> they are narrated and recorded and dis disseminated as podcasts uh, in M M3, MP3 format. But they are also now writing these Bible stories in Seputi. Uh, next slide, I think. Now, I, uh, Sheena is going to take over and talk about, about our language documentation project. Thank you, Matthias. Um, so as Matthias mentioned, I'd like to now um, introduce and say a few words about the Saputi Language Documentation Project, which has been running since 2016. Before I do that, though, I'd like to just say a few words about the classification of Saputi. Siputi is classified as belonging to the Tequila branch of the Nguni languages, with Siswati being its closest relative. However, it's heavily influenced by Sesotho through 200 years of contact and also through intermarriage. Now back to the Siputi language documentation project. This is a collaborative project which involves numerous local language consultants in South Africa and Lesotho. Zaputi speakers were identified together with Letsatso Komerzi, who's um, the um, president of Libatla Labaputi and also the co-author of our presentation. And these speakers were then trained in language documentation methods and techniques. Now, this is an ongoing process with one to two in-person workshops every year on different aspects of documentation and continuous remote discussions and exchanges. Now on this slide, you can see some of the local language consultants during one of the training workshops on transcription. And here is another workshop. This time it's on recording techniques with video cameras and audio recorders. The language consultants learn to operate these devices and then practice using them by recording speakers in the villages. They then got to practice their newly acquired skills and record the important Morosi commemoration event, which Matthias mentioned, the one that takes place in November every year and is attended by about 100 people. Up to now, we've um, more than 230 Saputi speakers have shared their knowledge and stories in this community-based Saputi language documentation project. These include older speakers, younger speakers, women, men, mine workers, subsistence farmers, small-scale businesswomen, the list goes on and on. And you can see some of them here. Each single recording contains metadata, so that's data about the data recorded. We include here things like where the recording took place, when it took place, who is part of the recording, what role they played, so were they a speaker, were they an observer. We include also things like topic, the genre, the languages used in the recording. And this means that these recordings can be understood by anyone who listens to or watches them. We include various genres, so things like narratives, interviews, conversations, focus group discussions. Since we're also interested in the grammar of Saputi, uh, we do targeted elicitations where we ask speakers, how do you say so-and-so in your language? The recordings cover a range of topics. These include testimonies on the past and present of the Ebaputi, uh, people's stance on the future of Saputi. We also record songs and prayers. And many of the topics are chosen by the speakers themselves. So they tell us that they would like to speak on a particular topic. 
Some of our recordings contain more modern topics, like the ones we did with this women empowerment group in Hampapa in, um, in Lesotho. They meet on a weekly basis and they mentioned some of the challenges and successes they face in their small scale business activities in rural Lesotho. Other recordings include more traditional topics, like this woman who is coating the floor at Bethel, an activity she does about once a month. And here she's coating the floor, and at the same time, she's explaining what preparations are needed, why she does this, does this etc. The recordings that are made serve to provide new and specialized vocabulary for a larger ongoing dictionary project, which we're conducting together with the speakers. This will allow for a more comprehensive record of the lexicon. This ongoing dictionary project, project contains words and example sentences. And many of these example sentences have been taken directly from the natural conversations um, from the recordings conducted. Our recordings often include various languages, not just Saputi. And we know that this is normal from the Southern African context where speakers regularly speak several languages on a daily basis and code switch between them. So in this particular recording, the woman at the back is speaking Sesotho pretty much the whole time, while the other two speakers are speaking Saputi. Our recordings are annotated using a program called Elan. With Elan, a user can add an unlimited number of textual annotations. So an annotation can be something like a sentence, it can be a word, a gloss, it can just be a comment. It could perhaps be a translation, or it could be some sort of description of any feature observed in the media. And these annotations can be time aligned to the video. So you see an example of this on this slide. And then when all of this is done, we upload the recordings with the annotations and the metadata so that it's available to all of you, to the public. Our digital corpus is currently housed at the Endangered Languages Archive in Berlin, and it will soon also be housed at the South African Center for Digital Language Resources in Pochestrum. This means that anyone, anywhere can view, can listen to, and can watch the recordings and learn more about Saputi and the Evaputi. Now, here's an example of what you as a user would see when you want to view a particular recording. At the top is the metadata where you can learn more about the particular recording. So here we see that the topic is about chieftainship and you can read a short description about the recording. You also see where the recording took place. So in this case, it's Harale Bona village and you see who, for example, the speaker is. And in this case, it's uh, Pelazzo Tequa. And at the bottom, you see the associated file. So the video recording in this case and the Elan transcript and annotations. Now, who are the potential users of this corpus? Well, first and foremost, the corpus is for the community. They can use the corpus for various activities, language maintenance activities, also for producing teaching learning materials, etc. It's also for linguists. They can use the corpus for their own research and linguistic analyses. And the last group who might be interested in the corpus are academics more generally. So the corpus may be of interest to historians, cultural anthropologists, etc. So as both Matthias and I mentioned earlier on, our project is highly collaborative. And Matthias and I, together with Letzato Komerzi, who um, I mentioned before, the Saputi speaker, who's the, also the president of Libadlala Baputi, we wrote a, um, a paper about um, the collaborative nature of this project. And it's open access, so in case any of you are interested in reading it, I will share a link in the chat um, just now. And I'd like to now hand over to Matthias, who will say a last few words before we move on to the Q&A. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so since the, the reason for, for this webinar uh, is uh, the 200 year celebration of the Kingdom of Lesotho. Uh, I would like to mention that at that time, you know, in, 18, in the 1820s, uh, King Mushweshwe I recognized Morena Morosi 
as the ruler of the southeastern part of the country. So which means today's Mahalis um, Hook, Kuting, Kwacha's Neck. And, um, and um, there is great hope that uh, in October, when the official celebration uh, of this 200 years event is taking place, that by that time Seputi will be officially recognized as an, as an official language of Lesotho. There is an amendment uh, on the way, which is uh, hopefully going to be approved, so that uh, Seputi along with Isiklosa will be the two additional uh, official languages next to Sisutu and, and uh, English, uh, and which will, will, will then also address the suppression and sufferings uh, which the Ebaputi nation uh, experienced during colonial power, by colonial powers, but also by Lesotho governments. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So there is now only uh, just briefly two short slides which are not part of the presentation. So one is um, there is an, we, we do have a, um, a Doku Africa uh, website where we where you can listen to uh, the poem of Maleba, uh, Malebela um, in, in Seputi, uh, where he talks about uh, his responsibility towards um, revitalizing the language and speaking the language. Next slide. So this is part of that. You see there it's it's on the Baputi is a beautiful nation made by sewing and so on. Uh, so that's a poem which he we recorded and um, videotaped and and we hope that you will be interested in listening and looking looking at that. And then the last slide here is uh, um, that Letzazzo Gomezzi, the dean of the of law at at the University of Lesotho, he he translated uh, the Little Prince into Seputi. Uh, and this is the first book ever published uh, in the language. Uh, and um, we, we, yeah, this is a big achievement for, for, for this language community. Yeah. And so finally, we thank to the University of the Free State for, for all their support over those years. Uh, and um, also there, yeah, of course, our our uh, involvement um, with the with the with the community wouldn't have been possible with a lot of support by Paputi friends. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Wow, that was very insightful. I I, I think you also deserve a, a a round of applause. I'm not sure, Dr. Matthias, if you're going to stay behind because I understand. Um, um, uh, uh, that uh, Shinama is about to leave. Yeah, I will. I will be here. I will be okay. able to answer question uh, to answer questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I call, uh, the members of the audience, do, do you have a uh, questions, comment? Anyone who wants before Shina uh, leaves, will you be still be given a chance to raise uh, questions uh, later? In the chat, uh, can you see, uh, be able to read? There's a, um, a, a Dr. Matusa has, has, has shared some uh, some uh, something on the chat. Uh, doctor, are you able to read that? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm able. This is great news. I mean, we saw the amendment, uh, uh, and um, there are some technical problems. We understood, so it's. Basically, there is no opposition to, to the official recognition, as we understand, but there are some formal challenges, uh, like it's uh, like a package which needs to be approved, uh, and, and this uh, entire package still needs to be discussed, uh, and, and, and this is upholding the, the whole process of recognition. But uh, yeah, but it seems that it's on the way, and, and this is what the statement here already also mentioned mentions okay thanks a lot any other questions uh, from the audience dr shinata i know we are going to leave soon thanks a lot for that uh, wonderful presentation we really appreciate it and we're looking forward to the next uh, webinar 
I just want to end by saying thank you very much for organizing this. This is a remarkable webinar to, to have put together. I thoroughly enjoyed the first um, talk. I'm very sad that I'm going to now miss the others, uh, yes. but I'm hoping for more events like this in the future. So thank you very much to, to you and to everyone in the audience for joining us today. You're welcome, Doug. Thank you. I see there's a hand up, uh, May uh, 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 Putti. Uh, I have a I have a question in the chat. I don't know if they'll be able to answer it before they leave. Oh, okay. Is it up there? Michael, uh, are you able to, so to say I, it uh, out if you don't mind? Yeah, I, I, I see my father is a putty. Uh, from uh, Botswana, did you oh. perhaps have a chance to find out if there is a connection with the uh, Baputi in Lesotho? Um, we, we are actually working in Botswana as well, so we know Botswana, uh, many many parts of Botswana, but we didn't come across uh, a, a Baputi. Um, uh, I mean. There, there must be some uh, Baputi probably working in the mines. I'm not sure whether your father uh, was there, but does he originate from Lesotho? No, he, he originates from Botswana. Um, it's a it's Baputi in Botswana. Um, they they are in Lubatse, the Putis. Ah, okay. Yeah, I don't but know. But they you don't mean. they don't speak the language anymore. No, they don't speak the language. That's why I thought maybe was there a connection or migration or something, but there's a lot of Baputis in, in Botswana. In 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 um, yeah. Yeah, there are also many in Cape Town. You know, there is a big community, uh, uh a Baputi community in Cape Town. Yeah. Uh and um but I mean, with regard to the language, uh, it, it's mainly in Matatie and Mount Fletcher. I mean, main, mainly Matatie actually in South Africa, where where the language is still spoken, and where also the children are taught uh, uh, to speak Seputi. Uh, and otherwise, it's as we mentioned, those two areas in Botswana, the Daliwe and Ising, uh, and 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 Singondo. Um, so. Um, yeah, so we are not aware, but but we will follow up uh, uh, next time when we are in Botswana. We will follow up on 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 the Puti in in Botswana, and uh, that's very interesting. Yes, I'll get information and probably send it to you so you can start. <laughs> yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, this would be wonderful. Thanks. Uh, I just see that China uh, um, sent the link to the Malibela's poem. Uh, which takes about six minutes. So maybe after the webinar, uh, some of you might be interested in, in listening to 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 this presentation uh, by our our Ibaputi friend. Thank you. Any other question, colleagues? Um, as I've indicated, uh, um, I forgot, and uh, I may even lose my job to to play. Uh, the recording uh, by our DVR research and internationalization. It's not very long, it's about three, uh, two to three minutes. Uh, with your permission, whilst you're digesting these two presentations, I would like the, the, the colleagues from, from, from the IT team uh, to, to play it. And immediately after that, I will then uh, uh, move on with the, with, the, with, the, with the program, with your permission. It's not that long, it will just be uh, uh, two to three minutes. Technical team, can you uh, please assist? And apologies for that, uh, um, colleagues. The UFS Library and Information Services Director, Jeanette Moropiane, the University of the Free State Library and Information Services Management Team, the University of the Free State Library and Information Services staff, the University Librarian, National University of Lesotho, Dr. Bushler Mbambo Tata, colleagues from the National University of Lesotho, panel members, esteemed guests,
program director, and of course, the UFS Library and Information Services and National University of Lesotho community within and across the two borders of our country. I am deeply honored to have been asked to offer my support for this webinar, an initiative that celebrates 200 years of Lesotho's existence. This is a significant milestone. I also apologize for not being able to be physically part of the festivities. The UFS has a long and well-documented, warm and cordial relationship with the people of Lesotho. Therefore, we felt it necessary to play our part and host this webinar appropriately titled Joined at the Hip, the UFS Library and Information Services celebrate the Kingdom of Lesotho's Bicential, a befitting description of the type of relationship that is shared by two sovereign states. Program Director, colleagues and friends, there is an African proverb that says, we can live without our friends, but not without our neighbors. Although its meaning is open to many interpretations, I believe that the UFS community has long considered Lesotho as a true, real, and valued neighbor that we cannot live without. That is why today we raise the glass to 200 years of Lesotho's existence. The panelists were carefully selected for their vast and diverse knowledge on what have cemented and sustained the relationship between these two neighbors over the ages. I once more congratulate the UFS Library and Information Services community and indeed the entire university community for hosting this webinar. I hope that you will learn much from the presentations and exchanges of our esteemed panel members who I am informed will nourish us with their thought-provoking perspectives and insights. And finally, I wish our neighbor Lesotho and her citizens a happy 200 years of existence. Indeed, we look forward to the next 200 years. And I thank you. Thank you. That was our, as of what was Professor Aredi, uh, DVR Research and Internationalization. Let's give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Moving on, now we're going to have our next speaker, Dr. Khabele Matrosa, who is a visiting professor at the Center for African Diplomacy and Leadership at the University of Johannesburg and Vet School of Governance, University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. He holds a PhD in political studies from the University of the Western Cape, a postgraduate diploma in conflict resolution from Uppsala University, Sweden, a master's degree in development studies from Leeds University in the UK, a BA in political science and public administration from the National University of Lesotho. He's a former senior governance advisor at the United Nations Development a program, UNDP, Regional Service Center, RSC, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. He has also researched and published widely on migration issues in Southern Africa and, be and between Lesotho and South Africa. While at the African Union Commission in Addis Ababa, he collaborated closely with the International Organization of Migration, IOM, Representational Office of the AU, and led the development of the protocol to the Treaty on African Economic Community Relation to free movement of persons, right of residence, and right of establishment, which was subsequently adopted by the African Union Assembly of Heads of State and Government in January 2019. His latest, uh, latest publications on migration in Africa include Governance Challenges for Migration in Africa, which was published in 2022, Worlds Apart Perspectives on African uh, EU Migration, Lesotho South Africa Relations, a case for free movement of persons across the common border, and the free movement of persons and African migration. 
which was published in 2023. It is, ladies and gentlemen, very lo long um, a bi a biography. I tried to make it short, and um, I would like to hand over to you, Doc. Uh, let me uh, then project your presentation. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, am I able to speak from the, the video or should I just leave it? Uh, if you don't mind for a minute, Doc, if yes. Oh, if you do, I, yes, I can, we can, yes, we can see you, Doc. You can also see me. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yes. That, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's really my pleasure to, 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 to be here and uh, to join this uh, important uh, uh, knowledge forum uh, 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 today. Uh, you've already introduced me. I don't need to. Uh, yes, uh, well. Yes, I don't need to go there. J just to add that uh, as the, the, the NUL librarian uh, indicated, I'm also the chairman of council of the National University of Lesotho so that we also try to strengthen or cement uh, the, 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 the collaborative relationships between the National University of Lesotho and uh, the University of Free State, of which we are very uh, uh, proud and we hope uh, uh, these relations can be uh, deepened further. Uh, with that said, uh, my task uh, today, the simple one, is to share with you my thoughts as we celebrate uh, the hundred years of uh, the Kingdom of Lesotho, to, 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 to share my thoughts with you on a subject that is very close to my heart, the migration issue. Uh, and some of the previous uh, speakers touched on this in passing, but I'm going to deal with it in much more depth. Uh, the, the migration, uh, Lesotho, South Africa migration, and, and, and I'm going to make a case uh, in that regard for free movement. There's need for the two countries to really seriously uh, put in place free movement of persons uh, between uh, the, the, the two countries across the common border. Uh, the, the, the whole practice of, uh, you know, restriction, restrictions, uh, including the, the use of the passport, the, the stamping and all that, it's, it's really an inconvenience to both the citizens of both countries. So I'm going to make a case for free movement of persons. And, and this uh, presentation actually emanates from uh, a chapter uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, Mondi referred to, is in this book uh, that came out this year. Uh, the title of the book is uh, okay. a Rutledge Handbook of Contemporary African Migration, uh, published uh, in London, uh, Rutledge uh, 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 Publishers in London. Uh, this this year, 2024. Uh, so my chapter in there uh, is entitled. Um, um, uh, let me just read it for you. She, she, he, he, he referred to it. Uh, it's entitled "The South Africa Relations: A Case for Free Movement of Persons Across the Common Border," which is exactly what uh, the program uh, suggests. So I'm going to just be, distill some of the key, uh, 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 the, 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 the key messages that come out of that chapter. The next slide. Uh, so in doing that, uh, I'm going to just uh, uh, you know, focus on three main, main issues. Uh, uh, the next, next, next slide. Or am I? Oh, yeah. The next. OK, OK. OK, OK, it's fine. Just, just let's start there. It's OK. Because I, want, I was going to say I'm going to do just two things. I'll start with just the context, and the context is to show why Lesotho and South Africa are bound together. Somebody said bound at the hip, and uh, uh, the, the librarian said bound by the soul as well. So I'm going to start with the context that will show why we are bound together as the two countries, but essentially one country at, at, at the end of the day. And then I'm going to make, second, I'm going to make a case for free movement and, and, and uh, the ties that bind us. What are the ties that bind us? And then finally, I'll then say, what is the way forward? So context, three main issues to raise here. Because I want to demonstrate that uh, we, we, we have three main bonds that 
us together, the two countries, the Sotho and South Africa, which then, in a sense, makes our relationship very unique. It cannot be compared with any other country uh, neighboring South Africa. It cannot be compared with Zimbabwe. It cannot com be compared to Botswana. It cannot be compared with the Swaziland. It cannot be, no, 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 not even Namibia. No, no other country it can compare with, with us in terms of our relationship with South Africa because we are right inside South Africa. Now, the three bonds are like this. First is the socio-cultural bonds including ethnic ties uh, we are ethnically related to south africa so, you know the, the, the south africa in, in, in a big way uh, uh, kinship and family ties language ties and cultural heritage uh, so so that that that's what binds us at, at, the, at the social level second at the political level and this is also the, 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 the political one. Actually, it's 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 a point of 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 happiness and pain. Uh, in that we are bound together also by ties, including struggles against colonialism and apartheid. Uh, uh, Lesotho continued the formation of the, the the African National Congress, for example, in 1912, and the adoption of the Freedom Charter in 1955. But under the apartheid, we also uh, suffered pain uh, of, of, of the apartheid system that uh, uh, saw uh, the, the South African National Defense Forces under apartheid then uh, 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 mounting two military raids in Maseru, uh, one in 1982, leading to 40, 40, 42 people killed, 30 of which were uh, South African refugees and 10 were Basutu and nine killed in 1985 uh, were South African refugees and three were Basutu. Next slide. The third bond, we go to the third bond, next slide. The third bond, uh, I'm not sure whether, uh, oh yes, yes. The third bond, there it is, is the economic bond, uh, including we are one integrated economy. It, 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 you know, it, you know, it's just it's just a formality to be talking about the South African economy, the Russian economy. There's nothing like that. We are just one economy, uh, bound together. For example, in, in through the common monetary area. That's why uh, the Lesotho Loti is uh, packed uh, on, on uh, at parity with the South African rand. Now we have the South African Customs Union. Uh, that's where we participate together with South Africa, Botswana, uh, and Namibia, and uh, and, 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 and Swaziland. And so that, that this this is what actually makes this economy one and the same economy. Then we are also living together by the Lesotho Highlands Water Project. We supply water, all the water that uh, uh, South Africans used used in in Johannesburg is Lesotho water. Is Lesotho water? The, all the water that is been that is used in in, in South Africa, the Houghton Province, comes from uh, Lesotho. Migrant labor system. Uh, other people refer to it. Other speakers before me, uh, it also uh, ties us together at the economic level. But so the migrant workers have contributed significantly to South Africa's own economic development and advancement. Uh, while they are in South Africa, remember in Lesotho, uh, the population is 2.2 million. But the population of Lesotho in South Africa ranges between 4 and 6 million. So we can see that. Uh, the the, 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 the the population the, the Basutu population in in Lesotho it, it, the Basutu population in South Africa is three times higher than that of Lesotho. There are about uh, currently there are about four hundred thousand Basutu migrants in the South Africa in, in South Africa as we speak, uh, uh, spread across different economic sectors: mining, manufacturing, construction, farming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Next slide. So this is the economic tax. Now, let me then give you a story about the, why, why we're making a case for free movement of persons. Uh, the two countries, as we have said, frankly, social culturally, politically, and economically belong together. So there have been some efforts aimed at you know, uh, easing uh, 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 migration, in particular of Basutu to South Africa, uh, to, 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 to make it easier for, for Basutu to, be, to live in South Africa. The first of these, and this have actually all of them been uh, uh, 
it, it, it was the twilight of the, the, the apartheid uh, system and also in the post apartheid era. Uh, the first of this was the, the 1990 NUM, National Union of Mine Workers Resolution, uh, that, uh, what, 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 that questioned the existence of the borders between the South of Africa. So the mine workers, because the, the, in, in, in the mining industry, uh, the, the, the largest contingent of foreign uh, uh, migrants are from Lesotho. So that was the first uh, issue, that, that was the first uh, attempt to uh, address the issue of the border, to, to ease movement of Basotho migrant workers across the common border. Five years down the line, after uh, South Africa's independence with uh, Nelson Mandela as the founding president of, of, of the independent South Africa, uh, Nelson Mandela uh, made an important gesture of solidarity with, with Basotho by having a, a migrant workers that had, been, that had been in South Africa since 1985, what was then called permanent residence permit. It was a once-off uh, offer that was given to uh, Basotho migrants uh, then in 1995. That was the second uh, effort. The third was then in 2001, there was a agreement between the two countries uh, I, I, I recall between uh, President Becky then, and I think uh, here it was Prime Minister Mussisiri, uh, 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 in Lesotho. They then signed the Joint Bilateral Commission of Cooperation, JBCC. That was the first uh, formal, uh, official uh, uh, cooperation that uh, aimed to actually strengthen the cooperation between the two countries. And six, down, six years down the line, they, they, they strengthened that uh, uh, cooperation by also including facilitation of cross-border movement of persons as part of the JBCC. Uh, 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 and then in uh, 2015, uh, uh, that we, we started to have the Lesotho Special Permit uh, introduced. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was the permit that started between uh, 2015 and 2019. Then uh, when it expired, there was a second uh, permit uh, uh, regime that was put in place between 2020 and 2023. And then currently, as we speak now, we have the new uh, uh, LSP, LS, L, L, LPS, uh, the permit, LSP, no, the sort of special permit, it should be LSP, not LPS, LSP. But now the current one is between 2023 and 2026. And uh, we now, the JBCC was now transformed in 2022 to now the current framework that is now called the Bionational Commission between the two countries. Now it, 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 has, it has escalated, or, 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 or yes, it has elevated rather, it has elevated the status of JBCC to the heads of state. So on the, on the side of South Africa is the president, on our side is the prime minister, uh, uh, President uh, 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 Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, presently and prime minister Samuel Nsugwane, on our side, uh, 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 as it were. So uh, now, after it was then uh, transformed, the official launch of the new uh, uh, framework was in 2023, in September, if I recall very well. Uh, the next slide, but I, as I'm saying, as, as we go to the next slide, I, I want to uh, 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 say this, that much as we see all these frameworks uh, that are encouraging, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's a good story to tell, but on the ground, the free movement has not yet been realized. That is the, 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 the dilemma. The free movement has not yet been, been realized. So there's still a lot of hardship that Basutu experience uh, going through the border as they visit South Africa for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so let's uh, uh, then move forward. Uh, then let's make the case then for free movement. The, here is the case that we're making, that, uh, that we, we, we can draw lessons from you know, all over the place, but there's been a tendency to focus more on the UK, Ireland free movement of persons. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think it is too Eurocentric uh, 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 that, 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 that kind of approach. We, 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 much as we can draw uh, uh, lessons from the European context, those may not apply neatly to the African context. So we have to draw lessons from the UK, Ireland model, well and good, but we also have to look at other examples on the continent. And for that reason, next slide, for that reason, that 
the, the model that uh, would, would, would suit for us on the continent is the Senegal Gambia uh, relationship. The Gambia in West Africa is almost totally surrounded by Senegal. You know, much, much, pretty much the same way that Lesotho is surrounded by, 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 by South Africa, except that with, with, with the Gambia, it still has, a, you know, a, a, a breathing space to the, to the Atlantic Ocean. At present, they, 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 there's a free movement of persons between the two countries, which is also premised or predicated upon the ECOWAS protocol on free movement of persons. Citizens of the two countries crisscross borders easily using the ECOWAS passport or the ECOWAS ID. They, 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 they don't use passports. No, they don't use passports. No, they, 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 no. Let me put it. They don't use their own passport, national passports. So there's no uh, a Senegal passport that you, can, you have to use to cross into the Gambia. There's no Gambian passport that you have to use to cross into Senegal, but rather use the ECOWAS passport or the ECOWAS ID. There's also, there's also a right of residence and right of establishment in each of the countries. So although autonomous as sovereign countries, the government allow free movement across their common border. So let's go to the way forward. I'm concluding. On the way forward, I want to suggest five practical strategies. Next slide. Five practical strategies of realizing free movement between Lesotho and South Africa. One, Lesotho and South Africa should ratify, domesticate, and implement the 2018 AU protocol to the treaty establishing the African economic community relating to free movement of persons, right of residence, and right of establishment. This is easy to do. Both governments just need to commit to free movement of persons and then ratify this AU, African Union protocol. Second, the Sotho should start now to negotiate with the South African government for the extension of the 2023-2026 Lesotho special permit beyond the year 2026. That process should start now so that it doesn't uh, get uh, you know, uh, 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 delayed uh, and then it, it inconveniences uh, Basotho students and, 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 and those uh, who are working in South Africa legitimately, who have Going to South Africa uh, without you know, with using a legitimate means and legitimate uh, uh, crossing points. Thirdly, since both countries now have constitutional provisions for dual citizenship, they should start extending this facility to their citizens. Results of the 2018 Afrobarometer survey show a strong popular support for dual citizenship between Lesotho and South Africa among the Sotho themselves. Fourth, so, so the third is dual citizenship, implement dual citizenship. The fourth, the use of passport. When the Sutra and South Africa citizens cross common borders should be abolished. Citizens should only use their national identity cards instead. Citizens of both countries should enjoy full rights of entry, residence, and establishment in both countries. And finally, fifthly, special attention should be given to the Sutra migrant workers, students, cross-border traders, border communities who crisscross the common border daily for survival and most of these in fact almost all all this all these five you know uh, strategies to uh, south africa to, to lesotho and free state in particular and lesotho and the eastern cape mainly so 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 basically at the end of the day we're talking about lesotho and and and, and relating to the free state as a province and Lesotho related to the, the uh, Eastern Cape as a province. So th this can be also done at the level of uh, 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 governments, governments, uh, uh, you know, uh, pursuing these strategies, but also non-governmental organizations have to come to the party. With those few remarks, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention. I would like to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, a lot, Doc, uh, for that very insightful uh, uh, presentation. Um, uh, and I'm also one of those people who believe in, especially when you talk about these two countries that, we, as I said, we joined at the hip that we should just be applied this because uh, those residents, people who are living at the border, they don't even regard themselves as uh, separated from, from, from each other. 
is do, well, is there a, a problem in terms of uh, government to government when he, what is it that is stopping us? Why do I uh, do have to wait until uh, now? Why 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 is it taking this long when it's just easy now? For, I mean, what you've just presented is just a case that these uh, two countries, especially the communities, why not just let them just uh, live as 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 uh, as, as neighbors in, instead of having all these uh, uh, police and who will be at the border uh, in, in dating them um, sometimes taking them to jail. Uh, is it something that is practical uh, that can happen in the near future, uh, Doc? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, absolutely. It, 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 this, the issue of uh, facilitating free movement between the two countries is, is something that is practical. Yes. And that can be done you know, uh, 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 even as soon as possible, provided one, there's political will on both sides. Here, what, when I talk of political will, I'm, 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 I'm actually speaking to governments. Yes. If political will, that's number one. Number two, there's need for civil society organizations on both sides to push for this. On its own, it may not happen. Yes. Uh, so, so there's there's need for civil society also to be, uh, you know, to really and and, th and 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 talking about civil society, what we are doing here is actually a part of that, because yes. we are we are part of that society. We are part of that society. Yes. As, in, as as universities, so it is important that we continue doing this to uh, make sure that this knowledge is imparted uh, and and it it, it, it filters down. To, to those that are also uh, 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 you know, in, in charge of policy. Third, we, and this is my final point, well, I think it is important that we de-emphasize borders, we de-emphasize security issues, because we, we, we have come to realize that these borders are, are, are considered as security shield is it with South Africa on its side, it considers this as a security shield. So everyone who crosses the border is automatically regarded as a potential criminal, even before there's evidence that that person is a criminal. So, so let's desecuritize the border. That's my three points in response to your question. Thanks a lot. And uh, uh, the, our director from the UFS is also agreeing and is also uh, uh, being radical uh, and saying it's maybe this time we should just abolish the, the, the passport because we, uh, she, we regard ourselves as, as, as cousins. And that is also uh, from the director from NUL also says we are more than cousins and sisters and, and brothers. Uh, I don't know whether you want to comment on, uh, on that, uh, Doc. Absolutely, absolutely. And actually, it's one of my recommendations as I, was, as I was going through my presentation. I think uh, it, 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 it becomes part, as part of recommendations. I, I, I've said, uh, I've said, I've said that there's no need, frankly, given the relationship between Lesotho and South Africa, there's no need for a Mosotho going to South Africa to be using a passport. Or for a South African coming to the suit to be using a passport. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it, it's it's just the bureaucratic, mm -hmm. you know, a, 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 what's the word? A bureaucratic a, a inconvenience. Mm -hmm. You know, can, can you believe it? You know, uh, 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 the iron of it. When I travel, uh, recently I, I traveled to Bujumbura in Burundi. I traveled to Bujumbura uh, last week. Last week, when I travel. I get my passport stamped in, 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 in the airport, Mushashawan International Airport, right? And I take yes. my flight. I go to OR Tambo International Airport. My passport gets stamped. Yet I'm not I'm not going into South Africa, by the way. I'm on transit. My passport gets stamped again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Twice. So my passport gets stamped twice. When I come back, it gets stamped in Bujumbura. When I land in Burundi, when I come back, it gets stamped in Burundi, it gets stamped again at OR, and it gets stamped again. So look at that inconvenience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So there's no need, frankly, there's no need for this passports. That's why we're emphasizing dual citizenship. That there's need for the two countries to really, frankly, you know, strive towards, you know, officially uh, 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 implementing dual citizenship. In any case, both their both both our constitutions allow this. Implement dual citizenship, and once you do that, there's no need for a passport. Only the international ID would work. Uh, thanks a lot, Doc. I think we should also be thinking in terms of the continental uh, um, agreements also, because if I if remember recently, I think it's one of the richest African uh, businessmen, uh, Mr. Dangote, also, quest, also mentioned that how difficult it is for him to, to, to yes. get all these when you're going to the Africa compared to when he's going to outside of Africa. That is a lot of, 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 of stumbling blocks when it comes to visiting Af each, our, uh, each other within the continent compared to when she has to fly to say to France or to Europe. He doesn't have any problems, but when it comes from visiting one Af African country to the next, it's always a, a, a problem. So uh, I, the, I think it's something that we need to maybe as maybe make it continental and people like you well, got the 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 also the, the the chance of being on this public uh, continental platform, maybe to also raise it so that we can be able to drive from here to Cairo without having uh, all these uh, uh, problems, having to produce passports. Why do we have to struggle from some Cape to Cairo, having to produce passports all the time when we are within the African continent? Absolutely, absolutely. And and the, the irony is this, you know. Um, I, 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 I worked for the African Union for, 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 for a number of years. And uh, when I was there, we are the ones who developed the African, the, the protocol on free movement of persons for the continent. Uh, you know, you, you will not believe it that, uh, like what Dangote was saying, it is, it is easier, can you believe it? It is easier for me to travel to the United States than to travel to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? It is easy. Mm -hmm. for, for example, let me give you a good, a good example. I have a, a visa, a, an entry visa, 10-year entry visa to the United States. Mm -hmm. right? I can go there easily. But for me to go to South Africa, I have to queue, I have to, to join a queue at the, at, at the border and get my passport stamped as I go in and stamped as I go out. Mm. So, so, so you can see that. And, and what is interesting is that uh, when we developed the free movement protocol for the African Union, uh, the, 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 there was more appetite for the free movement of persons from West Africa and East Africa. And there was comparatively lesser appetite for the free movement from Southern Africa. And guess what? The stumbling blocks, the two stumbling blocks for, 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 for the free movement in Southern, the, the, uh, the main stumbling block was South Africa. South Africa is against free movement of persons. The argument from the South African government is that if they allow free movement, they will allow, if, if they will open up floodgates. Can you imagine floodgates of uh, uh, migrants, including criminals? coming from all over the continent. That, that's our problem. Now, this, this also you know, uh, fits into xenophobia in the country. It fits into the xenophobia that we are seeing in South Africa now, the, the Operation Duduna that, that we know of. It, yes. it, it emanates from that, that mm. mindset, that, that uh, the continent will flat, they will have uh, floodgates of migrants, including criminals. That come mm. into South Africa. That, this is the, 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 the dilemma. So, until and unless we, the, the, the leadership in South Africa changes its mindset, hopefully, let's, let's look at how the GNU, the GNU will look like <laughs> you know, once, once the contract is in place, whether there will be a change of mindset mm. on migration.
Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks a lot, Doc, for that uh, engagement. Uh, I, I hear that the, the home affairs is going to fall on the other side. Uh, that is also scaring. Uh, we're talking about GNU. <laughs> That's a discussion for another day, but let's keep okay. our fingers crossed. Thanks a lot, Doc. We really appreciate it. And I uh, can you. promise you this is not the last time that you will, will be knocking on your door. We really Thank appreciated you. your, 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 your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give Doc another round of applause. Thanks a lot, Doc. Thank you. Yes, and uh, lastly, uh, we're going to have our last presentation uh, from Professor um, F. Christopher William. Pro, uh, Prof. William, are you on the line? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 Prof. Uh, I can hear you. Uh, if you don't mind, you can start maybe sharing and putting your camera on for a minute while I'm uh, while prese uh, and presenting your your short bio. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, is it uh, morning uh, over there? Are you you muted, Doc? Prof. It's a uh, morning here in Virginia, but it's uh, the middle of summer, so we're already at 30 plus degrees, uh, not even. Nine wow. <laughs> no, thanks. 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 Uh, uh, Prof. I just want to to give you a, a short uh, uh, bio. I know your biograph is very long, but I, uh, I want to, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce um, Prof. Christopher Williams. When we started, uh, when I started uh, 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 engaging, uh, I was uh, having this um, bio, which says that you are an, uh, a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and International Affairs at the University of Middle Washington. And then later you told me, no, I'm leaving the place and now I'm an, <laughs> I'm an independent scholar. I thought I should just also mention that. And previously, a, a, a Prof. A William was a postdoctoral research fellow and, 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 and a lecturer at the International Relations Department at the University of the Witwatersrand Rand in Johannesburg, South Africa. He holds an MA in Security Studies from Georgetown University and a PhD in International Relations from Fletcher School of Global Affairs at Tufts University. In 2018, Prof. Christopher was a Bradlow Fellow at the South African Institute of International Affairs. His research focuses on allied foreign policy decision making and security issues in sub uh, Saharan Africa. Welcome uh, once more, uh, Prof. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate the um, introduction. Are you able to see the screen I'm sharing now? I'm sharing some documents here. Um, not uh, we can see you on maybe uh, not not yet let's see it says uh we need permission to share your screen um and i'm not sure if the permission is from the administrator or is it from me uh i colleagues from tech uh, i i think it, are you able to go up check the the share uh, button up there yes i've got that and i've chosen to Let's see, maybe I can. Um, okay. Is that working now, perhaps? Uh, not yet. Uh, nothing from my side. Okay, let's see. I will, can you just try maybe again? What, what is it showing? Um, it should be showing some some PDF documents, uh, some archival documents that I'd like to to speak to here. Um, let's see. And um, it says the perhaps the security, uh, or maybe it's because of the screen recording that it's doing that. I'm not sure. Um, let's see. You think so? Yeah. Um, well, I can I can certainly do without. It would be nice for the, the yeah yeah everyone to see it. But um, so well, you don't have a presentation like to maybe to email it. Was I don't know whether it will allow me from my side to. But yeah. if it doesn't work out, you can uh, just go on for the sake of yeah. time. Uh, I'll take just one more second here, but it does not look like I can do it. So uh, okay. no problem. I'll speak to it regardless. So. Um, 
First, I'd like to begin by thanking the University of the Free Street Library, the National University of Lesotho Library, the Endangered Archives Program, the Africa Hub there, the Mushwishwe Leadership Institute, and the British Library for putting on this very nice event. Um, I have two goals today for the discussion. The first is to present and talk about some of the resources available uh, to research Lesotho's modern political history. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to show some of those resources right now, but I'll certainly uh, talk about them. And I'm happy to, if it, anyone has further questions, to, um, to share those documents. Um, and the second goal I have is to look back at Lesotho's tumultuous politics, especially in the 1990s, where a lot of my research has been focused, um, and to kind of understand the dynamic, the security dynamic that developed between Lesotho and South Africa during that period, and how that dynamic really holds to this day um, and affects the relationship between the two countries. So I'll begin by talking a little bit about the archival research uh, on Lesotho. And one thing I found when I began to do some research on this is that the political history of Lesotho in South Africa is very intimately connected to the personal ties that developed between the leaders across that border. And so the first document that I well, would like to share but uh, can speak to is a letter that King Moshwe wrote to what was then Deputy President Mandela only a year after he got out of prison. And we kind of forget that uh, King Moshwe II and Mandela had a very close relationship uh, in fact, Mashwishwe II was one of the first to call Madiba after he exited prison in February 1990. Um, but in 1991, by that time, King Mashwishwe II had been exiled. He had run counter to the military regime that ruled Lesotho at that time. And so he was exiled in London. Um, but at the same time, it was all for Tambo. And Mandela regularly visited Tambo. And so the three, Mashwishwe, Tambo, and Mandela, met more than once in London in the uh, early 1990s. And what's fascinating about this encounter is that it's recorded. So if you go to the ANC archives at Fort Hare University, um, it's not just focused on the African National Congress, although there's plenty there on that as well. You can see all the relationships that the party had um, for its many years in exile. And one of those relationships is with different political parties in Lesotho. And King Moshwishwe in particular was a prolific writer of letters. And I found more than 25 letters he wrote to Tambo, Mandela, um, the former Secretary General of the ANC, Alpenzo, and other senior officials. Um, and in these letters, you get real insight into how King Moshwishwe II thought about his country, its relationship with South Africa and its relationship more broadly in Southern Africa. And one of the fascinating things about these letters is that you get insight into how uh, Kim Wishwai II thought uh, South Africa could fit in to the politics in the Sutu. And so in 1991, Mandela was a huge superstar, of course, and he was considering visiting the Sutu. Um, and Wishwai warns him against that very clearly. He talks about feeling great anxiety at the prospect of Mandela visiting the Sutu. And that's because he doesn't want Mandela to bestow legitimacy on the military regime at that time. And so even early on, we have an example of South African actors becoming involved in the Sutu's politics. And it's also just fascinating to think about uh, these major leaders like Moshe II and Mandela and Tambo um, thinking about the history or the future of Southern Africa at this early point of the 1990s. Um, the second document I'll, I'll speak to, um, and I'll talk about a different archive, is the Archive of Department of International Relations and Cooperation uh, in Pretoria. And um, the Durko archive uh, is regulated by the PIA Act, the Promotion of Access to Information Act. Um, and I joke with colleagues that the acronym is kind of mislabeled because although it's supposed to promote access to information, um, you could very easily call it the Prevention of Access to Information Act. It's very cumbersome. It takes a long time. Uh, it's not very user friendly. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, with persistence, uh, with developing a good relationship with the archivist, it, it's possible to find um, some really rich documents at the Durko archive there. 
and I was just sh uh, shocked when I got there. Um, and it, you could just see binders and binders of archival documents uh, dealing with South Africa's relationship with Lesotho. Uh, and one of the most telling documents I found during that time, uh, once again, dates back to the early 1990s. Uh, this is 1994. And um, in 1994, Lesotho has had its democratic transition, um, but the new BCP government under Prime Minister Mohele is not able to control the military. And so at that time, you had different elements in the military uh, fighting amongst each other. Um, some might remember us, they took up positions uh, in the hills surrounding Maseru and actually began lobbying ammunition back and forth in artillery. And so faced with this prospect, uh, Mohele calls in uh, for South African assistance. This is before the transition. So he's writing to de Klerk, not Mandela. And he requests very clearly a peacekeeping force to come in. Um, and so once again, we have an example of uh, Lesotho's internal politics from precipitating a request for intervention by South Africa. Um, so those are just some of the examples uh, about uh, these archival documents in South Africa that researchers on Lesotho's political history can access. Uh, and the last kind of area for archival research that I'd highlight um, is beyond South Africa. Um, I found really relevant documents at the United Nations Archive, uh, the Foreign Commonwealth Office in the UK, and the United States State Department all of which have uh, digitized and declassified hundreds of documents on Lesotho's politics um, that are available to researchers. So I would encourage uh, those who are interested in Lesotho's modern political history to um, certainly do the work um, in the region, but also look abroad. Uh, and I think there's some really very valuable research that can be found there. I've illustrated a couple uh, of these points, you know, I've chosen some of these illustrations to make the methodological case that some of these documents can be found and that they can really add insight into understanding uh, how decision making takes place within Lesotho. Um, but I've also chosen these documents because they show, I think, a theme. And this theme is that whenever there are domestic disagreements in Lesotho, Lesotho leaders tend to draw outside actors primarily South Africa, into those disagreements in the hope of bolstering their own positions. And so now I want to turn to this theme a little bit more and talk about that in particular. And I think the, the time to start looking at this is 1994, which I mentioned previously. And this is a very tumultuous time in Lesotho's uh, political history. Um, the democratic transition has happened, um, the BCP government uh, wins the election in 1993 and takes power. But because of Lesotho's first past the post system, um, I think the BCP wins 70 something percent of the vote and the opposition BNP wins 22 percent more or less. Um, but the BNP gets zero seats in parliament. They're completely shut out. And so because of this, you have a dynamic in which there's an opposition that's extremely frustrated, doesn't have representation. So that's a key problem in 1994. You also have instability in the military. Uh, the military had been sympathetic toward the BNP. Um, a lot of its uh, officers were BNP affiliated. And so when the BCP comes in, there's real concern uh, that the BCP will put in their own guys, the LLA fighters, and that uh, the soldiers will be, will be ostracized. And finally, you have uncertainty in the monarchy during this period. Um, King Moshwesh II had been exiled when he had, um, him and the military government had had arguments. And so young King Lutzia had been put in place. Um, but then Moshwesh II returned. And so you had this conundrum, one country, two kings. And so that was also roiling the political landscape at the time. And so all these tensions culminate in August, 1994 in what's called a king's coup in which let's say the third uh, suspends the elected BCP government uh, and puts a provisional government in place. And this really precipitates a crisis in Southern Africa. Um, the presidents of Southern Africa, especially Mandela, Mugabe and Masiri, 
are very involved in trying to um, ease this tension and try to negotiate a solution. So there's several summits held uh, to resolve this. The crisis goes on for about a month. Um, some might remember the South African military stages exercises just on its side of the Caledon River to try to intimidate um, the Lesotho government. And ultimately, um, this ends uh, in an agreement um, to restore the BCP government. But I think one of the important things of that agreement is that the regional governments, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, um, and Botswana are, can, are guarantors of that agreement legally. And so this really establishes a precedent about the region and South Africa in particular becoming involved, guaranteeing peace. And so this brings short-term tranquility to the kingdom, but in the long term, I think it establishes a, a difficult pattern. Only four years later in 1998, we have re renewed instability after the elections in May 1998. Um, and at that point, the LCD government, led by Moses Sidi, requests on several uh, instances for the South African government to inter intervene militarily. And of course, eventually it does. Um, South Africa intervenes in September 1998. Um, and I think we should be clear about this. This is not some rogue decision by Butelezi. This is a decision in which Mandela played a very uh, instrumental part. Um, he had been sympathetic towards even intervening in 1994. Um, and he had decided in 1998 to intervene, to calm the military amongst other factors. And um, this intervention causes more than 90 deaths. Uh, there's serious destruction in Maseru, Mahalisuk, and some other towns. Um, so this is a significant moment in the history of uh, the relations between South Africa and Lesotho. Now, after that, we have a period of some calm, but the, the dynamic that's developed doesn't really go away. So in 2014, when there's a coup attempt against Tom Tabane, he flees to South Africa and asks for South African military intervention again. Um, there's constant intervention of South Africa and SADC more broadly um, during the roadmap for reforms and national dialogue. And just last year, you had Sam Matakane writing to SADC, um, asking for help because the opposition was trying to dethrone him through the vote of no confidence. And then the opposition in their own letter writes to Sadek talking about Matakani's um, potential military coup, as they call it. So what we have here is a pattern, uh, a pattern in which Lesotho's domestic politics uh, are externalized. And, you know, the question that I have is why does this keep occurring? And one potential, at least partial answer, I think comes via the concept of what's called moral hazard. And the idea behind moral hazard is that uh, providing insurance for a party or a group of individuals can actually cause those who are insured to behave irresponsibly. And that's because whether the insured behaves cautiously or rashly, it doesn't matter. They still get bailed out. They don't deal with the consequences of their actions. And I think you see this concept in action in Lesotho. Um, Lesotho politicians from a range of parties, this is not a criticism of any one party, um, they have something in common. They're not inclined to compromise. And I think part of the reason for that is they have come to expect that if a political crisis skids towards violence, or if you have real political gridlock in trying to negotiate reforms, they can always look outside to South Africa or SADC to intervene. Um, so identifying this dynamic doesn't really provide any easy solutions. Once the precedent is set, it's difficult to break. Um, but to conclude, I, I feel like South Africans' interventions in Lesotho um, have, over the last three decades, um, unfortunately been unsuccessful. The repeated interventions have the unintended consequence of making Basutu leaders more intransigent. And so perhaps stepping back whenever possible could be the answer. Taking away outside sources of leverage might just encourage Basutu leaders to be more cooperative and less combative with each other. So I'll stop there and I look forward to questions.
Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Prof, for that insightful uh, presentation. It's a, it's a pity that you are unable to to share so that we can be able to ex share, see exactly. I was interested in that uh, letter when you're talking about uh, the king uh, being a prolific writer, uh, like yes. together the content. Unfortunately, uh, we I'm not aware of it. Um, just keeping off my fingers crossed that maybe to allow you this time around. <laughs> And that's the, the beauty of the archival material because you get to see exactly the the actual uh, to read the, the the actual words and to go deep into the 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 writer's uh, uh, mind. Uh, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, members of the audience, do do you have uh, comments or questions uh, to to prof? Anyone? Uh, yes, uh, Janelle. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the presentation. Yo, I'm just requesting that you, you share the presentation with us so that we can go through, because I think it has a lot of literature that we are going to, to learn from. Yeah, so that we are also uh, kept informed and also to influence our ideas with regard to research going forward. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for the comment, Jeanette. And um, I'm happy to speak with any scholars further about kind of the research process and, and how sometimes it can be intimidating about how to approach these archives, what's actually required. Um, but uh, the logistics are sometimes the difficulty. But if you want to understand, you know, how do you get to Fort Hare? How do you kind of in, interact with that archivist so you can set up a time to go through these letters? Um, it is laborious, but I think that the payoff is real. Thank you. I see two hands. Uh, is it, uh, uh, pardon me, I see it's Rosemary and then Morocco in that order. Uh, thank you, Prof, for, for uh, this uh, valuable information that you've shared with us. Um, I just want to find out you have you have spoken about um, a number a number of areas that have got um, you know archival material. I just want to find out whether you also visited the Freedom Park and and University of Cape Town because uh, uh, I, I was told recently that uh, there are there is a, a lot of information about Lesotho and Basotho. Uh, at the University of Cape Town, as well as, uh, as at, at the Freedom Park in Pretoria. Mm. Have you ever uh, visited those those areas as well? Um, when I was doing my research a few years ago, Freedom Park's archive was still being set up. So I would always hear rumors about what it contained, um, but I did not visit there myself. So uh, it's very possible that they've now got that system set up more. In terms of the UCT archives, yes, I've heard that, but I've also heard that it deals more with Lesotho's kind of deeper history. And I was interested more in the period 1990s moving forward. Um, and so I did not spend a lot of time at the UCT archive, although I've heard the same thing you have. But it just kind of, you know, you have to really sort of think through what period do I want to be focusing on um, and then kind of target the, the archive that way. Um, so you know, if, if you're interested in deeper history, um, for example, the Lesotho's time as being part of the Cape Colony, the UCT archives I've heard are very interesting during that period in the 19th century. Um, so I think, yeah, being, and this is what we, one of my recommendation, recommendations is when you're approaching the archivist, be very clear about the kind of questions you're addressing and the time periods you're looking for, and that'll help them respond to you as to whether there's any useful material available. Thank you, Prof. Uh, uh, Morocco, and then uh, uh, Dr. Boutle after in that order. Oh, I think it's from Morocco Pula Heritage Productions. Ma Monday, can I, I just email you? Do you mind if I just email these documents to you quickly? It'll only take a second. There's only three, and perhaps you can just throw them up quickly, and I'd be happy to speak to them. Uh, that way as well. I would really appreciate it. Whilst maybe the colleagues, the, the next two speakers are raising the question, you can forward it to me, forward them to yeah, me. Yeah, I'll forward it to you right yes. now. 
Anyone who wants to raise the... I, I'm ready to shoot. Okay, okay, Doc. Um, thank you very much uh, for that um, interesting presentation on the modern history of uh, of Lesotho. Uh, but my, my and, and and I'm really fascinated by by the way you use the archives and and which archives you visited. But my comment is to generally to uh, whoever is on this call. Uh, I'm from the National University of Lesotho, and uh, we we are in the process of setting up a a um, a map of where the Sutu's archives or holdings are on the on the globe, and I've just put my contacts there. If anybody on the call has Lesotho collections, please contact me so that we can, uh, as part of this 200 year celebration, have mm. a um, a map of where do we find Lesotho archives. Um, and 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 what, where, where possible, perhaps to link to those if they are digitized. So yeah. uh, please, there is my um, uh, contact at librarian at nul and dot ls, or anybody researching Lesotho uh, also can can contact me contact me at that address. Thank you very much for a fascinating uh, presentation on the modern history of Lesotho. Thank you, um, Doug. And I would just I would just add that um, a lot of the challenge is the digitization um, because sometimes those documents are there, uh, but you know it's it's a very awkward process where you're with your digital camera taking pictures like this, you know, um, and you can spend hours there. Um, and so, for example, the Fort Hare archives are like that, um, where there's not a lot of digitization that has taken place, only very select collections. Um, and so that's both exciting because you can go through the documents yourself. Um, but it also is an extra layer of work for sure to do that. Thanks, Doc. Um, uh, just on the chat, uh, uh, that's uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Matosis. Well, my closer is, is congratulate. Since I congratulate Prof. Williams for his formative presentation, I would like to get his presentation and also his contact details. Um, the second from Dr. Matthias was also raising, um, saying that Dr. A uh, David Ambrose has a huge archive on Lesotho in Lady Brand. You might uh, want to visit him. Hmm. I would I would second the suggestion about David Ambrose. Um, on my way back from Maseru on a couple trips, uh, I would stop at Lady Brand uh, and speak with him. Um, he has both a large oral history collection. Um, as well as just a, a range of documents and everything from paleontology in Lesotho to its political history. Um, but just for example, um, he was very close to many of the kind of formative political leaders. And so he told me, for example, about a com uh, conversation he had with Malapo Kobela, the former foreign minister. And he just sat down uh, with Kobela one afternoon for three or four hours and, and wrote up his version. And uh, of course, these oral histories have uh, the personal biases uh, of each individual politician. But together, the researcher can triangulate that information to really get some, I think, valuable information. So I found his discussion with Cobello, for example, to be very helpful. Thank you. Any other uh, question or comment? Uh, Monday, did the uh, documents come through? I just sent them over to you. Uh, let me check. Uh, anyone who wants to? There's still a hand up, Monday. Okay. I'm just checking on the email. Uh, if you don't mind, can you take? I'm just looking at the ear for this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Morocco or Ms. Morocco, please. Ula, you can speak. Nothing from us, huh? Maybe there's a problem with the mic. I don't know. Oh, you can okay. you can just write on the chat. Uh, if there's a problem yeah. with it. I just want to share my screen and uh, 
Not yeah, sure so it's, it's, oh, great. Thank you for putting it up, Monday. Yes. Um, so this is the first letter I mentioned. This is a letter from King Moshe II. Um, he's in London at the time. And uh, if you just scroll down a little bit on the PDF, you'll see, okay. you know, we had a very friendly tone with, with Tombo and Mandela. It was wonderful to see you. But then yes. the, part, the parts I've highlighted there, he's telling Mandela, um, you don't want to do anything that would, quote, give a semblance of acceptability and legitimacy to the military regime or give comfort to them. Um, mm -hmm. So he's making a very um, political point to Mandela. Don't don't legitimize this regime. Don't uh, embrace them in the halo of your celebrity, you know, as Mandela was after he got out of prison. OK, and I move on to uh, the next. OK. And you can, and like I said, I mean, I was just perhaps, uh, you know, Mr. the second, you know, just spent a lot of this time in exile, really thinking through what he wanted the future of uh, Lesotho and Southern Africa to look like. But as I said, you know, some of these letters to Tombo and Mandela are 10 or 15 pages long. So you really get a view of his uh, kind of political um, vision for the future there. And this is the second document. Uh, yeah, you can just increase a little bit. And this is um, from uh, Mr. Mohele, and he's writing to de Klerk in January 1994. Um, and you can see, as you just scroll down a little bit, the dramatic language he uses. He says, the military is definitely on a bloody collision course with all the disastrous consequences which might flow from that situation. Um, so you can imagine in South Africa at the time how this was received, and I have some of the documents from the former South African foreign minister, Puk Butha, and basically the South Africans in January 1994, they're trying to set up an election. Um, and so they say, we've got other things to deal with. Um, and so at this point, the, the uh, crisis in the military is resolved peacefully, partly through um, negotiators uh, in the Commonwealth at the time. Um, that had resolved this this immediate military standoff, but the tension in 1994 continued, and and ultimately culminated in this King's coup that I referred to earlier in my presentation. Wow, that is very interesting. Uh, are there any hands as I'm trying to stop sharing? Great. Thanks for putting that up, Monday. I appreciate it. You're welcome, uh, Prof. Uh, colleagues, any other? Um, let's, uh, colleagues, uh, we've come to the end of this uh, very insightful uh, presentation. And also this afternoon, I think we've learned a lot about our neighbor and we really joined uh, at the hip. And uh, we can't wait for the other uh, uh, events. And uh, Prof, I'm te after this presentation, I'm telling you, uh, it's not going to be the last time that you hear from us knocking on your door. Eh? <laughs> and we can't wait. And even when it happens that maybe you drive uh, or fly uh, to South Africa, maybe on your way to, to Lady Brand, uh, uh, you can just let us know. Maybe we can be able to arrange something and then be able to meet uh, uh, physically. We really appreciate uh, uh, your, your 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 time. And colleagues, I think uh, 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 you're parting shot, uh, uh, Prof. Just a minute. No, I, uh, I appreciate the invitation, uh, both to address the audience here today, um, and I do travel to South Africa uh, on occasion for for continued research, just like I I spoke to you about. Uh, so I would love to engage further. Thanks a lot, Prof. Colleagues, uh, now come to the end of this uh, 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 webinar, and uh, I think we need to to, to just uh, uh, a round of, uh, of applause for all of us and uh, for just being part of this uh, uh, occasion. And I'm, I'm I'm really excited, and uh, and I've learned a lot. I'm also thinking that you also have learned a, a, a lot, and. Um, I would also want to thank uh, from the um, beginning the, the two um, uh, heads of the libraries, uh, um, uh, Director May um, Jeanette Moropiani um, and, and Dr. Buse Mambo, who are, are steering the, 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 the ships and from uh, both countries. And we were really uh, happy about this. And we can't wait, as uh, um, Dr. Buse has indicated earlier, inviting us to the conference, that we can't wait to, to, to be also part of, 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 of it and also other events that are also uh, in the lineup. 
and we really uh, are looking forward to these uh, festivities. 200 years of, of, of existence. And also would like to thank uh, in absentia Prof. Reddy, uh, De uh, Deputy Vice Director Research and International Internationalization for, for uh, present, uh, his uh, um, message of support. And also our wonderful presenters, starting with uh, Menta Bising, uh, Dubazana, who had to leave, unfortunately, but where her presentation uh, um, really uh, it was food for thought and we also enjoyed uh, uh, dr matthias and and unfortunately she had to had to had to leave thanks a lot uh, dr matthias please send our regards to, to dr shina and we really appreciate it and i'm hoping that also we uh, like uh, like as i said with prof uh, uh, christopher we are also this is not the end of it. We're still going to to knock on your doors, and uh, there's a lot that we've learned that we still need. That we I think we still need to 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 um, engage in. I mean, the future project when it, when talking about uh, these endangered 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 uh, um, um, languages as a library. I was like thinking we've got this African uh, press that uh, at the University of the Free State that maybe it's time we also take this to another level in terms of making sure that we document all these, especially your endangered, uh, endangered uh, uh, languages like um, uh, Siputi. And we really, really appreciate it, your, 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 your presentation. And uh, uh, Dr. Habele, oh, that was also wonderful, your presentation. And uh, we really uh, uh, enjoyed it. And uh, also, as I've indicated, I think you will, will, the first thing is to also go into all your the presenters if they've got them. Um, uh, 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 books and uh, maybe challenge uh, both libraries that we we if we don't have those collections we start uh, thinking about uh, uh, co uh, collection development because they are very uh, uh, in, uh, the information that they've shared it means that we need to take it into our onto our shelves and make sure that our 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 library patrons also get a chance to 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 indulge and and be able to spread this uh, this knowledge. We, we I can promise you that we are also going to do that, especially as the the books that the the all the presenters um, have published. And lastly, as I've indicated, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, William, uh, also thank you for your uh, presentation. And to all of you, the wonderful audience, thank you. I know it's a, it's a Friday afternoon, but you you decided to be here and, and lend a lot. And I think you also deserve a round of applause to the technical team, the marketing team, and also thanks for the for 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 the wonderful job that you you, you have done at the, the University of Free State community, the National University of Lesotho community, the library, both libraries. Thanks a lot for 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 this wonderful event, and we're looking forward to the next one. And uh, have an, an enjoy and enjoy the, the the weekend. And I can't wait. Uh, uh, for the next uh, um, um, event, which will be also a, um, a, a collaboration, which is a collaboration between these two uh, uh, countries, these two libraries, these two universities. Have a nice uh, evening and a nice weekend. Thank you.